As, as was said, my name's Ian Robertson. I work for Brocade here in Australia. Um, so I'll give a very, very brief overview of who Brocade is, since it's not a name that a lot of people will be familiar with. Those that are, of you that are familiar with us will probably know us as a fibre channel company. You know, we do fibre channel storage and have done for years. But a few years ago we picked up a company called Foundry Networks and last year we picked up Viata as well. Um, so we're rapidly moving into a space where hopefully you'll see us more and more. Um, on top of that, yes we do see OpenStack and in fact OpenFlow as well is quite important to us as a company. And um, to that end, we have already made contributions and we will continue to do so. Networking and OpenStack, our view on things has been that OpenStack has rightly or wrongly treated networking as a little bit of an afterthought. Now that's not surprising. Obviously Nova has been um, one of the far more important areas of OpenStack, as has Swift. But obviously as a network company, we do see that there are ways that we can contribute, particularly on that networking side. Um, and in particular, we do see some gaps in Neutron that we are um, actively trying to help resolve. Um, and that's essentially the core of what I want to talk about today. We'll talk a little bit about what we're doing on the fibre channel side as well, but the, the vast majority of my interest as a network engineer is on Ethernet anyway. Um, and that's, I think, somewhere where there is quite a big gap that we can help uh, fill. So, so far, um, as was mentioned, we've already um, had code contributed and accepted, and the, the Red Hat um, flavour of what's being done with OpenStack already has certified the work that we've done. Um, we've done our own, more generally, we've, we've done a lot of work around making our own equipment work very well with Neutron. Um, now, I won't mention too much about it, but we're doing some very interesting things in that space, tying the action, from a networking point of view, tying configuration data to MAC addresses rather than physical ports, which makes the portability within the network a lot more flexible. So if a MAC address suddenly reappears on a different port due to relocation of those resources, there's no need at all for the network to be told about it. The network will just pick it up and figure it out itself. And in Icehouse, or moving towards Icehouse, we've proposed a couple of enhancements, one of which has been accepted already, and the other is currently sitting in review. Um, accepted already is some work around fibre channel zone management, and being able to use the zoning capabilities of fibre channel to, um, uh, to, to full effect within OpenStack. And the other part of what we're trying to do is essentially boils down to the ability to support multiple vendors or multiple um, com network components within the OpenStack environment concurrently. And that's what I want to talk about today. If there's any th questions along the way, please feel free to ask. Um, I'm quite happy to freeform this a little bit if it's required. On the zone, on the fibre channel side of things, um, essentially what we're what we've contributed and what we're working on at the moment is um, what, what we call automated zoning. Now zoning in fibre channel is essentially partitioning. It's a, uh, so it gives you a little bit more in the way of security and so on within a, fi a fibre channel environment. It allows you to allocate off resources and essentially isolate them. You can, if you're familiar with Ethernet, you may consider that it's a similar capability to what VLANs might offer in an Ethernet world. Uh, segregation of traffic, segregation of resources and so on within the environment without having to run separate physical um, fibre channel networks. And a big part of that is actually having a lookup service that allows you to figure out um, what resources belong where. And we already had all of these capabilities within our fibre channel equipment, um, so what we've done essentially is wrap those for senders use as well. The other part of what I wanted to talk about was what we've called in our draft blueprint, um, dynamic network resource management. So at the moment, uh, rightly or wrongly, Neutron's very much built around the idea of um, one set of network resources managed in one place. If you want to have a few different sets of network resources, some of them may be physical, some of them may be virtual, you may have two different vendors providing network equipment, or even two different models of network 
device from one vendor who may, have, may or may not have acquired a few different other vendors along the way. Um, and that's not easy to do. It's certainly compared to what, um, what Nova provides in terms of a certain amount of agnostic behaviour on the compute side is not really available on the network side. And that's what we're trying to fix. So essentially, um, what we're seeing, and this, this is a fairly complicated piece of work. It doesn't fit completely within Neutron itself because there's a lot more around it, particularly when you start talking about virtualized networking as provided by the likes of Viata. There's a, there's a fair amount of tie-in to the likes of Nova and so on as well. Um, so essentially what we're looking at is a way to intercept those calls before they hit the Neutron plugins themselves and pass them through to one or more other plugins to uh, forward the, the traffic where it's needed. Um, so this then would allow you to orchestrate the, um, the capabilities of OpenStack across multiple pieces of equipment. Um, the diagram there is not particularly easy. I'm going to provide the slides, obviously, so that they can um, be seen. That diagram is actually in the Blueprint document as well, and I do have a link to the Blueprint document uh, to provide. It's public, obviously, like everything else. Um, but essentially, the areas in pink are areas where we see there's new capabilities required. Now, between Neutron and the existing Neutron plugins, we see the concept of having a, basically a transparent shim that will intercept those calls and pass them to the appropriate components as and when required. And why might you need that? So, as I said earlier, one of the options is it gives you a bit of a choice over your networking vendor. So, for example, you might have started building an OpenStack environment with um, Brocade equipment. You might, in three or four months, decide that you actually want to introduce another layer two or layer three networking vendor into the mix, and that's fine. That's exactly what this is intended to allow you to do. So you don't have to rip out the existing equipment and replace it. Um, you can simply add to it over time. Another thing that it would allow is the ability to implement virtual routing alongside existing physical layer two. So as I said, we acquired last year a small company called Viata, who provides some very, very good layer three and uh, yeah, routing capabilities. And being able to actually spin those up on demand while also managing the layer two infrastructure within the same platform would kind of be handy. Um, likewise, being able to pick different products for different needs. You might, for example, have a customer who requires physical layer three routers for argument's sake for security reasons. You might also have other customers who want a much cheaper software-based solution alongside that. You might further have the need to be able to spin up and spin down load balancing capabilities on, on demand, and you want to do that within the networking component. So all of the, what we anticipate is that all of this will be possible. Um, the other part of what we're trying to make this useful for is to actually be able to use the Neutron components in conjunction with an existing environment. So being able to actually use Neutron to manage an existing network um, without necessarily making the rest of the environment very, very dependent on OpenStack as well. So essentially giving people a bit of a choice in terms of how that equipment is managed as well. Um, so, and again, that comes back to being able to dynamically allocate resources as and when required, either based on policy or based on point and click. So that's very, very brief. I didn't want to, I didn't want to throw too much at the talk as it were, um, but I would like to sort of get some feedback and get um, some thoughts from the um, audience as to whether this is the right kind of approach for us. Because one of the things is that, relatively speaking, Brocade has been involved in OpenStack for a little while, but now we're actually getting much more involved in the community, and we'd like to make sure that we're doing it, um, that we're contributing in the right way as it were. Sure. The, sorry, can you repeat that? In the, in the automated yes, uh, yes. For, for Cloudy yep. Um, just in terms of the hardware that you're selling, um, does that actually, um, expose APIs where I can basically remote control zoning 
on the on the switches, or how how would the interaction work there, and how would other vendors plug into that service? So my understanding of the way that's being developed at the moment um, is it uses the APIs that we already provided um, on that equipment. Now, in the case of our Ethernet products, generally we use NetConf as the interface to the equipment itself. Um, on the fibre channel side, I don't actually know the specific details of how that interface is done. But SAN zoning itself is not something that we alone support. S certainly, fibre channel wise, we're one of the bigger vendors, but um, for example, Cisco's directors also support zoning and, and do it quite well. Now, the Essentially, the way we've implemented, or the way the blueprint's built and the way we've implemented the code that we've implemented to date, yes, obviously, we've focused on making sure that it's qualified on our equipment, but we've done it in a way that should also port to the, well, pretty much the other vendor that has a fairly substantial fibre channel deployment at this point. Yeah, you'd typically use DCFM yeah. or, or Network Advisor or similar, yeah. So is that an indication that those APIs and protocols are becoming more open? Certainly all of the code that we're contributing is open. Um, and to that end, the API that is used is also available for use, be it inside um, Sender or Neutron or outside it. And that's the intention moving forward. One of the side effects of acquiring the likes of Viata is that there's now a lot more interest and focus in making sure that where it makes sense to do so, i.e. where we're not encumbered by uh, third party agreements, those APIs are available for use. And certainly there's nothing hidden in what we've contributed that would, that would be required to make it work as it were. Oh, sorry. So the, the question for the, um, for the video was essentially, how does this tie in with um, OpenFlow and software-defined networking? Now, directly speaking right now, um, so I'll answer the two questions in reverse essentially. Yes, we're very heavily involved in Open Daylight. Um, yes, we're also very heavily involved in OpenFlow. And the company has made a commitment to very heavy OpenFlow support across our switching and routing platforms moving forward. That's already the case with our higher end routers and switches, but you'll also find that our data center switches and so on are getting very, very detailed support moving forward as well. To answer the other part of the question, at the moment, the um, work that's being done with OpenFlow doesn't, isn't necessary in order to achieve what we're trying to achieve with OpenStack. But the intention is absolutely that the two will um, be treated as one. So essentially one of the plugins that you may choose to use to manage a range of switches might be an OpenFlow controller facing plugin that then manages the controller that then subsequently manages the switches for you. Um, so certainly we've been neck deep in OpenFlow for quite some time and it's actually pivotal to a lot of the work that we're doing moving forward with that in mind. We don't make our own controller, and we have no intention of changing that. Instead, we're very heavily involved in open daylight, as we see that as being a far more useful contribution that we can make. Uh, yep? Um, are VPC-style virtual networks supported in OpenStack today? Uh, VPC, virtual PC-style networks? Uh, like the Amazon uh, VPC-style <laughs> virtual networks that we're supposed to have. Yeah, where you've got like, a completely isolated L3 domain, uh, and so you're not moving to queuing and stuff. My understanding is yes, it is supported. Yes. Um, yeah. 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 Essentially, uh, virtual routing and forwarding support, which is um, in in hardware terms, the switching and routing hardware terms, that's where it would sit. But yes, uh, and I know that our 
uh, our physical equipment is capable of supporting that today. Um, I'm not as sure on the Viata side. I'm actually off to do the training on Viata next. Um, but certainly the intention is that anything that you can do on, the, on a physical um, device should be able to be translated to the, to the virtual world as well. I don't. Um, hmm, yeah, so I know that for us, we've been focusing very heavily on NVGRE and VXLAN. And that's with the hardware Yes. Yeah. Are there any other questions at this point? No? In that case, I'd like to thank you very much for the, for the ability to, to give this fairly short talk and um, appreciate the time. <laughs>